I remember they were throwing paper in the air and it was just this mayhem. I looked at him, I said, well, what's, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, this is where they work, this is what they do. This is what happens every day. I was just like thrilled. I was like, this is something I'd never seen before. You know, eyes got wide and I was like, <sighs> everybody looked like they were in a riot, but there was some kind of order to it. And I just had to be part of it. From that moment, I went literally back to my workplace and gave two weeks notice without having a contact without knowing how I was gonna get on the floor, I just knew this was where I needed to be. I needed to be on the floor. biggest pits in the world are here in Chicago. The Chicago Mercantile, the Board of Trade, Board Option Exchange, even the Chicago Stock Exchange. There's no place else that you have 9,000 pit traders all in one city. Nowhere else in the world. This is the bastion of capitalism. Player of railroads of the nations stacker of wheat, hog butcher of the world. That's what we do here. You know, if, if Chicago's known for anything else, let it, be, let it be the trading capital of the world. This is LaSalle Boulevard all the way down. Um, summertime, it's absolutely beautiful. All the trees are um, full up. This is where trading started. I mean, why do we have so many traders here? I think it really is an entrepreneurial spirit and it's a very competitive environment. I know the guys on the trading desks in New York are also very competitive, but it's not physical. Chicago, it's physical. It was based on gentlemen's rules. It was based on integrity, honesty, mutual respect. But the business in the pit was the furthest thing from gentlemen's rules. I mean, you saw the worst in everyone. When you're standing there and somebody spits on your face, that you know, somebody gets inadvertently stabbed with a pen or somebody steps on your foot or spits on you, like I said. And it's like something that you don't even really address. It's like completely you're immune to it. It's like, it's silent, it's quiet in, in the chaos. The physicality in the pit was ridiculous. We got to the point where at times the pit was so physical that before the start of the, the opening bell, we could pick our feet up off the ground and not fall. The open outcry process is, you know, 80% bravery. I mean, it's it's a perspiration game. You have to have you have to have nerve. Some are brilliant. Some are totally uh, eccentric. Some are totally nerdy. Some are just flagrant jerks. At the board of trade, the uh, interview process that I had to become a member, and I remember the one question they asked me: "What do you want to do?" And I said, "I want to make a lot of money and leave." But you never found an ad in the paper. You know, it was all people who trusted. You found a friend of the family got you on there because you were sharp or you had potential. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. My uh, older brother's four years older than me. Well, he'd already been trading maybe for about a year or so. And he thought I'd be really interested in it. I, I played sports in college. And my brother said that trading in general is kind of like sports, you know, and uh, when the bell goes off, boom. Like throwing a touchdown pass in Michigan Stadium like with 100,000 people with the cheering. Just that adrenaline rush. I mean, it's insane. It's not a normal job. I mean, it's not a normal job where you're, you're not getting a salary every two weeks. You don't have this health plan. You don't have your 401k. I mean, you have to do it yourself. 
when you've had a taste of the money, you don't want to go back to be in the corporate world. I mean, I, I, I just couldn't see myself working for a firm and just getting reamed on by a boss. Probably, I, I seriously, I'd probably tackle him or something. I'd be like, you know, who are you? This is Creedence Clearwater Revival. That's my acronym. This is my brother's uh, first album, The Endless Summer. And I got it for, you know, colorful reasons. You got your little groups. You got your Southsiders, you got your Northsiders, you got the Jewish clique, you got the Irish clique, you got the Italian clique. I'm Polish, I don't, I don't think we have a clique. You gotta mesh and find your niche. There's a lot of uneducated people, which doesn't matter. You know, the uneducated people have a tendency, too, to make good money. When you're in there from 8.30 to 3.15, it's all about money. One guy's misery is one guy's, you know, profit. Sad to say, but that's true. Not that I take advantage of that, but maybe I would. By the middle of the 19th century, Chicago was emerging as the transportation hub of America. Trade routes by rail and water converged on the city, giving birth to its famous stockyards and slaughterhouses, and a town hall market that would later become known as the world's first modern futures exchange. On April 3, 1848, 83 merchants founded the Chicago Board of Trade. Futures trading provided an opportunity for buyers and sellers to manage their risk against unpredictable price fluctuations. Too many cattle this year? Well, the beef prices are low. Drought in the Midwest? The corn prices go higher. If both the buyer and the seller can agree on a price ahead of time, we call this a futures contract. This agreement allows them the opportunity to protect themselves against paying too much or selling for too little. So who are all these guys yelling and screaming and what are they doing? As the exchange grew in popularity, at times there'd be more sellers than buyers or a demand with no one there to meet it. Entrepreneurs saw an opportunity to take advantage of this imbalance, working in the middle as both buyer and seller. This allowed them to profit by speculating with their own money while filling a vital need for market liquidity or the ease with which goods can be bought or sold in the marketplace. These early speculators became known as local traders. As their role expanded over time, they became major players on the trading floor. In 1981, the Chicago exchanges introduced metals, energy, currencies, bonds, and stock indexes, attracting more interest than ever before. Soon calls were coming in from all over the world. The modern local trader might trade hundreds, if not thousands of contracts in a single day, often getting in and out of trades in seconds each time risking their own money in the hopes of profiting as they hold their own against the expanding market. It was a live auction where the price of the commodity that you were trading was determined by who would pay the highest and who would sell it at the lowest price. When I would pay five and someone else would be willing to sell it at five, we would have a match. We would acknowledge it, check it in the pit by saying, you know, I bought so many contracts from you at this price. And then we'd write it on our cards. We'd end up handing in our cards to our clerks, and the clerks would take it to our clearinghouse. Yellow coats were designated for clerks. Other than that, all the different colors and different designs that you see down there, was to make you stand out among the crowd. There were guys that had checkered jackets, red, white, and blue jackets. Anything that made you stand out in your area of the pit because you needed to be seen. It's a misunderstanding that traders manipulate the price 
that they're responsible for prices going up or down. And it's completely false. The supply and demand drives that. If there's too little supply and demand is high, well, prices are going up. If there's too much supply and demand is flat, prices are going down. The traders are just in the middle. All they're doing is catching something for a tenth of a penny and passing it on hundreds or thousands of times a day. It's actually funny because when you first come down here, it's overwhelming. You can't figure anything out. And quickly you kind of discover well, that guy's a broker and he's an order filler and well, he's a big trader. All of a sudden people take on this personality so you get an idea of what's happening. Well, then you get some confidence and some you know, arrogance and you decide that you're going to do this because you've been practicing and you, know, you think you can do it. Well, that's really when the learning starts because that's when you realize how incredibly complex and oftentimes scary and difficult and, and hard it is. These guys are professionals, every one of them. Each and every day to go in there, trade your own rent money, not know whether you're going to make money or not, is uh, terrifying to a lot of people. And I found it to be very, very scary. And you know, I don't have any clients. I don't have any customers. And it, and it dawns on you, nobody trusts you to do what you do except your family. And so in a lot of ways, I'm a hedge fund manager of my own family's worth, money and they trust me not to fuck up. The nature of trading is buying for one price and trying to sell it at a better price, period. You get in there, you make your first trade. You know, if you get whacked 10 times in a row, you pick yourself up by the bootstraps and you do it again. We started at 7.20. By 7.30, we were dripping wet of sweat. Fortunes had been made and lost in the first 10 minutes. Everybody had their ups and downs. I had bigger swings um, due to the size I traded. It really depends on how much you put on. It, a five tick day, a five tick day, a five move from one to six, you can make millions of dollars depending on how much you put on. 100 lot, if you put 100 lot on in the Euro dollars, it's worth $2,500, okay? There are guys that have 2,000 lots on. So, you know, you're talking about $200,000 a move, one tick. So it moves five ticks, you're up a million dollars. If it goes five ticks against you, you're down a million dollars. If you traded a few contracts at a time, your risk was limited. If you went and took on the market and bought everything available, your risk was enormous. There were traders that went into the pit every day and risked a house. You know, it wasn't unusual for guys to be making 20, 30 grand a day. It wasn't unusual for them to be losing 10, 20, 50,000 a day. And a lot of times you did that on one trade. Whether people like to admit it or not, this is a form of gambling. How, how is it not? If you buy a stock, you're buying the idea that that stock's going up, right? I mean, that's, that's what we do, and options are the same way. I mean, there is a gambling mentality to what we do down there. It's gambling to go down there every day because you are risking something. But the rewards were phenomenal. Um, if you took the, the biggest risk, you're either going to get crushed or you're going to be the happiest man on campus this afternoon. I think somebody once said that floor trading offered blue collar guys a chance to get in with the big boys. Commodity trading only has two purposes. One, to make a lot of money two, to manage a lot of money. And the faster you make big money, the faster you can do things with your life. And I think that's what it's allowed me to do. The numbers for successful guys are fleeting because you're only as good as your last trade. It's what you don't lose. It really is. I mean, there's been guys who've made more money than me, but for some reason or another, they, they've, it was taken away. And so, I think the more successful trader is the guy who, who can keep it for, you know, to the tenth, to the ninth race. The good traders know when to make money and leave. I tell you, I, I went to work every day. And when I wasn't at work, I was a miserable human being. I mean, without a doubt, I wanted to be back at work because I knew how much money you could make. And so when I go away on vacation, I, 
it didn't matter what I spent because I knew I was losing more not being at work, you know. And then somebody said, but you could be losing money. And I go, you know, you never think of that way. Everything can be traced to being around the best traders in the free world. I would watch these guys trade in my pit. And I would say, if they're buying, I'm buying. If they're selling, I'm selling. But I also wanted to see, it was important to me, how they handle a loser. It's not what you make, it's what you don't lose that determines how much money you have at the end of the year. And I would watch these bigger traders and I'd go, how do they handle the stress of having a losing trade? What do they do when they had a losing trade? I literally just learned by watching the most successful people in the world. Certainly the numbers that come out of these places, how much money people make, can be staggering. Yeah, my assistant, who's pretty junior, she makes a little bit more than my brother does. My brother's a cardiac anesthesiologist. My assistant is three years out of college <laughs> and likes to drink beer. <laughs> you had a bunch of young kids making more money than they knew what to do with, and they found things to do with it. You know, I mean, anything that you can think of that you could abuse yourself with, that was part of the lifestyle. There were five guys that rented a bus to take them to Michigan golfing. They hired a couple girls to go on the bus with them. And uh, by the time they get, we get, we, it wasn't me, by the, I want that out. <laughs> My primary over-the-counter customer base uh, was made up of traders. They're fun guys. They're just fun to be around, and they're also, uh, they're nuts. <laughs> they're crazy. And I had a customer who, I rang him up and it was $172. He said, what kind of number is that, $172? Make it 100 or 200, one or two, one or two. I said, well, which should I make it? And he said, I don't know, let's flip the coin. So. I flipped a coin, he called it, he lost $200. We did this. Every time he came in for three years, he never won. We had customers flipping coins, he wanted to inspect coins, he never won. Every time, it was like two or three, I'd just say, what do you want to make the spread? He would do that, he never won. Every time he would overpay, he'd take the money out of his pocket, slam it on the counter and leave. Loved the game, loved the game. <laughs> Joey called me and said he wanted me to deliver some cigars over to the pit and that he'd meet me there and he told me to bring a hundred so I went over there and he met me and brought me onto the floor and I knew a lot of the guys because I was doing business with them some guys across the pit were like going like this to me and so Joe said they want you they want a cigar throw a cigar to him so I reach in the box and I throw a cigar across the pit and the guys are reaching up and grabbing the cigars so I threw them everywhere. I was just throwing cigars all the way across the pit. And whoever it is that's responsible for security in the pit or whatever it is came up to me. And as he approached me, he said, I'm the guy who's supposed to throw you out of here. <laughs> and he said, but I'm not going to. Can I have a cigar? <laughs> you know, every afternoon, the bond close. We would all prepare for it. It's like, OK, you know, bond close is hitting. When you watch those guys coming off the floor, I mean, you could see their moods. You could tell good days, bad days, you, got, you know, like, life-changing days, we saw those days. Um, but it was, it was palpable, I mean, it was no, this was not like, you know, five o'clock and everybody punches out and walks out of the office. Every time you make money trading, it's like applause, but only you hear it, because everybody else in that pit is rooting against you. You're competing next to folks for every single trade, and the fastest person, whoever says, buy them! Whoever says that first gets the trade. And you know your neighbor sitting right here next to you needs them as bad as you need them. He needs to make his mortgage payment. He needs to put the kids through school. But you're going to bury him. You'll tear out his liver uh, because you heard that broker say sold. And, and that guy is right there next to you. He needs them. And you just said, buy him. And he said, how many did I get? And you're like, none. A good friend of mine said long ago, he said, if you want a friend, get a dog. You don't have friends in the pit. Most of the people can set aside their differences outside of business.
But uh, sometimes when the almighty dollar gets involved, people don't care. I've seen guys yell and scream and, and say nasty things, ungodly things. That's what helps them trade. Yeah, and they probably don't like you anyway. True, that's true. They probably truly don't like you. There's no doubt about that. You know, if they had a chance to, they, they would hit you if they could. There will be fights in the pits. You know, no one's proud of that, but you will see people go at it. Well, there was a lot of fighting over who did the trade. Did you do it or did the guy next to you trade with me? One guy thought that he made the market. Someone took his trade. Finally, the guy lost his cool, ran over, and bit the guy in the nose. I was just under six foot three and weighed 255 pounds, and I had little guys that would come up and berate me. Guys would literally look at you and say, you're a fucking idiot. I can't believe you do that fucking trade. You'd look at them and go, you got to be kidding me. First of all, it was a good trade. That's why you're mad. And, and second of all, shut up. And I think the guys that want to strangle you after every trade, you kind of enjoy that. And you want to do that again and again, because that means you're doing something right. That was the famous line on Chicago was, you want to meet out by the horse, because we have this great big horse statue that sits out front. And that's where everybody would, if they would actually go down, they would have a group of hundreds following them. I look at him, he looks at me. He goes, yeah, let's go fucking outside. So we're walking out, and the motherfucker turns around and cracks me right in the fucking face, hard. I go, a real fucking fight, huh? He swings at me again, and I duck, and his hand goes through the fucking window. And the blood is spurting out like a, like a geyser. He goes, Mike, take me to the hospital. I look at him, I go, I think it's fucking too late. A lot of us have come from no education backgrounds, really, other than high school. You know, we all started trading young. Nobody knew anything. I made like two and a half million dollars in five days of trading. It's a pure business in theory, but you know, when there's so much money and things like that laying around, you know, you actually see what somebody's really like. And to go in there and try to be somewhat pure. And that's what I think I am, a pure trader, but I love the trading, but I hate the people. These are fun. This thing's on rollers. <laughs> so you know you're twisted when you do shit like this. You got problems. <laughs> They're so big, you can't believe it till you come up to them and see how big an animal is. You know, they think, oh, it's a giraffe. Things are, everything's dangerous in Africa, everything because everything's used to being eaten. When I go there, 